honorable guests, venerated chairman, and all my dear friends. A very pleasant morning to one and all present here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a moment of great pride that today with us we have Mr. Raghuram Rajan, Governor, Reserve Bank of India. And of course, Mrs. Radhika Rajan. Sir, ma'am, we thank you so much. We thank you all so much for sparing your precious time to visit our school. And also along with us, we have Mr. Sandeep Ghosh, Director, NISM. Mr. Raghuram Rajan is the current 23rd Governor of Reserve Bank of India. He was also the Chief Economic Advisor to India's Ministry of Finance and also the Chief Economist at the International Monetary Fund from 2003 to 2007. Mr. Rajan is a graduate from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. He acquired a postgraduate diploma in Business Administration from IIM Ahmedabad and is also a gold medalist. So here, if I may take the liberty, Mrs. Rajan, your husband is perhaps the most dashing and brilliant economist in the country, or may I say the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before Mr. Sandeep Sethi gives you details about the workshop, the brief idea is to make financial education known to all of you. And therefore, it's a financial education training program for teachers. Thank you. आप आ गए हो शाहे खुबाम मैं कहा है आज दिल का गुलस्ता खुश आमादीद This is how I was told that we should welcome guests in our city. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, students and teachers and principals, all people present here. This is a collaborated work with CBSC, that Central Board of Secondary Education, and NISM, that is National Institute for uh, securities market. This is a program that we are developing as to why your money should not go to the wrong place. That is what I understand in one sentence. We should not be putting the money where it should not go. It should be put where it should be put. So this program has been developing since the past three years with the NCRT and CBSC and very high uh, categories there. But we were not able to give it a proper shape until a few months back that we started off this uh, it's a 20 uh, city covering program where we're having 20 workshops all over the country in the first go. And the fifth workshop is in Srinagar after having started off at Delhi, Gurgaon, Amritsar, and Guwahati. So Srinagar stood fifth year that we are meeting here and we've got 15 more workshops to go. And as we've been assured, that there'll be a lot more happening. It's a two-day workshop, but I will not <coughs> hold you back. I'll be inviting Mr. Sandeep Ghosh, Director, National Institute of Stock Mar uh, Security Market, to brief you about the whole program and to take us from here. Over to Mr. Sandeep Ghosh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sethi. Uh, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, Governor Reserve Bank of India. Uh, Mr. Vijay Dhar, Chairman of the Board of DPS Srinagar. Senior teachers, Mrs. Rajan, senior officers from the Reserve Bank of India, Nabad, Kashmir University, and students. Uh, sir, this is a two-day workshop, which we call the Financial uh, Education for Teachers Training Program. And the general desire is that we give them a certificate of money smart teachers after this two-day workshop. This has been the last three years effort that we first started with a national level financial literacy test for the students of class 8, 9, 10 across the country. We test every year 100,000 students covering approximately 3,000 schools across the country and give them a financial literacy certificate which is signed by all the financial sector regulators. The second step was to create an All India website of the NCFE, which is the National Center for Financial Education. And this website today, you would be happy to know, sir, gets more hits than the Reserve Bank of India website. <laughs> the third was to conduct an All India survey, 
which is the biggest survey which has happened till now in the area of financial inclusion and literacy, covering 75,000 people across geographical areas in the country. And we would be doing a major conference to let the results of this survey uh, be announced as a part of that conference sometimes in January 2016. One of the projects this year was to create textbooks in the area of financial education for class 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. This project was completed in collaboration with the Central Board of Securities Education. And we are now into the next step of that project of training teachers across the country. The first phase trains approximately 1,200 teachers across the country. We have 50 teachers here from all across Jammu and Kashmir to attend this workshop. And we are presuming that one of the biggest gaps in the 21st century, unlike the 20th century where the battleground was basic education, 21st century the battleground is financial education. And post the financial crisis, global financial crisis, all the countries have a strategy towards financial education. The strategy in, the, in India has been launched by the FSDC, and this is known as the National Strategy for Financial Education. This strategy incubates in the National Institute of Securities Market and is supported by all the financial sector regulators. The general effort behind the strategy after doing all the activities is whether this can become financial education, whether it can become a part of the school curriculum. After all, if we remember Akbar and Baba, not only because they were great kings, but because we were tested about Akbar and Baba in each and every class. If we, rec if we recollect the periodic table, which has got nothing to do with our lives, we recollect the periodic table, the atomic weight and atomic number, because we were tested in those areas. And today, when this has become a global phenomena that when I say global phenomena, let me tell you that even in the US and the UK, which are reasonably developed countries, the financial literacy quotient remains to be very, very low. And one of the reasons is that we don't teach financial education or financial well-being or financial planning as a part of school curriculum. We expect the parents to take this up but if they themselves have not been taught in the school, most of them are not equipped to teach this. So, sir, we are conducting this workshop, presuming that the teachers will get educated in this area. And over a period of time, this will become a part of the school curriculum, where financial education would generally lead to financial well-being of the masses across the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Uh, for information for Mr. Uh, for all of the people present here, the books which are being launched for financial literacy have been made by teachers and students alike. But at the same time, Deepay Srinagar also has a contribution in those books. So it's a great pleasure, a uh, pat of pride for us that the books will be uh, showcased with the teachers today. And it has Deepay Srinagar in them. Students, for you all, it must be the most uh, like, if I was a student, I would know what, how important a day it is. Even as an education officer, day is very important for me. But as a student, this would be one of the days which you will remember that you did witness a gentleman speaking across the stage who could answer your question. So I now welcome Mr. Raghuram Rajan, the Governor of Reserve Bank of India, to address you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure of being here, uh, partly because I'm an alumnus of the DPS system. I graduated from DPS RK Puram in, uh, I hate to say it, but 35 years ago. So uh, once upon a time, I was sitting in those chairs and uh, watching speakers go by on stage. Frankly, I don't remember any of them. So uh, I hope uh, same fate uh, 
doesn't befall me. But let me uh, try and give you a sense of uh, what we're talking about today, which is uh, financial education. Now, um, financial education can be summed up in a few pithy sayings, at least the part uh, that was initially discussed and then I've gone to something else. Um, there's a saying in, in finance, there is no return without risk, okay? Which means that if you want to make a return, you have to take a risk. And if you take a risk, you could lose your money, but you could also make a lot of money. Now most uh, people trying to sell you um, investments, which aren't sensible investments, will pretend you can make a ton of money without taking any risk. There are lots of books written about how you can make billions investing. And the truth is, it's impossible to do that. There are very, very, very few people who've made their money purely on investing. Of course, those are the people uh, books are written on, but it's not something the average person can do easily. So no return without risk is one way of saying uh, be careful where you invest your money because anybody promising you a high return probably implies you have to take on a high risk, okay? Second way of saying the same thing is there's no such thing as a free lunch. You've heard that being said? Jimmy Carter, the former American president, used to say that often. That means that if you want anything in life, you have to work for it. You have to work pretty hard for it. If somebody is giving you a free lunch, it means there's something they want from you. They may not tell you up front, but once you've had the lunch, they'll present the bill. So point again is there's no such thing as a free lunch. Can't get something for nothing. In this world, everything is metered. Yes, you can get something for nothing from your parents. But your parents are looking at you as, you know, with love, with, uh, uh, with a lot of pride, and probably also because you continue their genes into the world. That's, that's the reason nature makes parenthood so, uh, such, such a good thing. A third way of saying the same thing is if it's too good to be true, it is too good to be true. That, uh, you know, when something looks really nice, uh, be careful. And examples of this abound. You know, every day, my office gets a call. Somebody got an email saying, congratulations, because of the war settlement in Turkey uh, as a result of the 1914 genocide, a sum of money has been set aside. Since we couldn't find the true recipients, we drew a lottery and your name has come up. You are now the proud recipient of 25 lakhs, which the Reserve Bank will transfer to your account. All you have to do is send 25,000 rupees up front as a small transaction fee so that we can send you the money. And please send the money care of this account, and it's an email from me with my picture, the RBI logo. You wouldn't believe how many middle-class people with a good education succumb to this and send that 25,000 and then call my office and say, where is the money, <laughs> right? My secretary has to keep saying, look, <laughs> you know, just be careful. Um, doesn't take much to cut a logo, RBI logo, and paste it from the web page. Doesn't uh, cost too much to get a photo and a signature. But this, people fall for this every day. And which leads to the last uh, sort of pithy phrase I want to tell you, there's a sucker born every minute. Who said that? Come on, you guys should know, general knowledge. Who said there's a sucker born every minute? Guy who used to run circuses. No, no, used to run circuses in around turn of the, turn of the 19th century. Guy called P.T. Barnum uh, in the United States said there's a sucker born every minute because he used to have these shows where basically he used to confuse people and make them, uh, make it appear that there was uh, tremendous magic going on. So the, the point here really is be careful that if something promises high returns, look at it very carefully 
because it probably uh, uh, is, is riskier than you, than you think. Now, financial education is more than putting your money, uh, more than not putting your money in the wrong place. It's also about putting it in the right place. How do you decide between investments? Because ultimately, investing well is a way of getting financial security. Financial security leads to economic security, and economic security leads to good citizenship. You can be a fantastic citizen if you're not worried about economic worries. You can say no at the right time to the, to the uh, when, when somebody asks you to do something wrong, you can say no. Because you have financial security, you can walk away. And that's, that's very important uh, in, in a democracy like ours. So how do you think, how do you figure out where to invest, how to invest properly. And for this, uh, the, the school I used to teach at, uh, the University of Chicago, uh, coined a term called efficient markets. And this is one of the central terms in financial security. What does efficient markets mean? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? It basically means that when you hear the announcer on TV, you, 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 you watch C, C, CNBC, for example, and somebody comes and says, this is a wonderful stock. It's been doing very well over the last so many years. Go invest in it. And the question is, should you go invest in it when you hear that? And the answer is, probably not. Why? Because along with you, five million other people have heard the same announcer say the same thing. And if there was actually news in what the announcer was saying, a bunch of people would go and buy the stock. By the time they finished buying, it would be too late for you to buy because the stock has already risen. Typically, stock prices contain most valuable information that's out there. There is no way of making an extra return because most of the information that you think is private, the announcer is talking directly to you. No, she's not talking directly to you. She's talking to you and five million others. And therefore, you don't get any special. Similarly, from reading the magazines. Similarly, reading those books which tell you how to become a billionaire overnight. The only person becoming a billionaire overnight is the one writing the book, not the one buying the book and reading it, right? So be wary of people who give you stock tips. Either the stock tip is wrong, or if it's right, a lot of people have heard it, OK? In fact, there's a, uh, there's a statistical uh, experiment, which is very interesting for those of you who've done some statistics. Here's how it works. I pick 128 people, and I tell them, you know, uh, I'm going to give you a stock tip. This stock is going to go up over the next two weeks. If it goes up, you know, send me some money because the tip works, OK? Uh, send me $10, not much. And I will, you know, thank you for it, and I'll give you more stock tips. So I send 128 such, right? Now, for 64, I say it'll go up. For 64, I say it'll go down, OK? Now, stock either has to go up or go down. Typically, it doesn't stay exactly where it is. So after one of these tries, 64 with 64, I've worked. it works out. Those 64 think, ah, maybe there's something in this. Let me send the guy some money so he sends me another stock tip. Next time, I forget the 64 for which I was wrong. I don't send them further letters. Anyway, I was wrong. For the 64 I was right, I send 32 letters saying it's going with a new stock, this is going to go up, and this is going to go down. You know how this is going to go, right? So 32 people after this will believe I'm right. I've been right twice, for the first time and the second time. Then I get to 16. I've been right three times. When I get to two, those guys have seen me being right five times in a row. And when I ask them to send me $1,000 or 1,000 rupees instead of 10 rupees, they're willing to part with the check. What have I done? Just played the numbers, right? I have no stock picking ability, but it seems to you as if I have stock picking ability. So again, there are ways and techniques of fooling people. 
But in general, it's very hard to beat the market on a regular basis. That's not to say you can't make money. There are returns available in the market because there is risk in the market. As I said, the first adage is no return without risk. You're going to take a certain amount of risk, you'll get a return. It's what is called a normal return on the market. And you get it best by not picking stock, but buying a portfolio, an indexed portfolio, by buying a number of stock. You don't really know about any one of them, but in general, they, they go up because stock prices generally produce a return. Yes, some years it'll go down terribly. Last few months, stock market has been going down, but before that, it went up. So long as you have a long enough horizon, buy a diversified portfolio of stock, you'll get a reasonable return on the market, okay? But it's important to remember stocks are just one part of your investment. You can also invest in bonds, in fixed deposits, in real estate, in art. And typically what people would say is hold a diversified portfolio. Sometimes stocks go down. But when stocks go down, your fixed deposits don't go down. Your fixed deposits provide a return. But because they're fixed and they provide a reasonable return most of the time, they don't provide you the high returns that stock markets could sometimes provide. So hold a portion of your portfolio in stocks. When the stock market does well, you'll feel really good. But hold a portion in, in fixed deposits because when the stock market goes down, you can at least pay for your food and you're not out on the street. Don't load up on any one thing, even though you're a sure return. And again, go back to there are no sure returns. Right? So um, diversification is really extremely important, is really the only thing that makes sense over time. Because you as busy individuals not you know, having to do a lot of work as you graduate and go and become lawyers and engineers and, and entrepreneurs, you're focused on real activity. You don't have time to study the stock market. Some of you will do it as a hobby. But in general, making money there is very difficult. And so better to hold a diversified portfolio, but be diversified. The problem in India is too many people hold very narrow portfolios. Your parents, for example, many of them didn't bother to hold stocks. I should say your grandparents. They invested in fixed deposits, most of them. And as a result, haven't made the kind of returns they could have made if they'd invested in a broader stock portfolio and benefited from the growth in stocks during the period of liberalization. What is important in all this is returns are compounded. And that's something to remember. The power of compounded returns over time, some of all of you know what compound interest is, that you get 10% this year, next year you get 10% on the 10%. So next year it's 21% or uh, you know, the, uh, the value of your, your um, assets goes up 21% from the initial year. So the point here is that Compounding can take you a long way if you invest sensibly in a diversified way, uh, hold a diversified portfolio. Often, you know, you'll hear your parents say, oh, this plot of land was only 10,000 rupees in 1951. I wish I'd bought it because today I'd be a Krodhpati, right? But ask the same question, if you invested 10,000 in a fixed deposit promising 10%, you'll also be a Krodhpati today. That's the power of compounded interest, okay? And so the point here is, uh, remember to invest. Sitting outside investments doesn't make sense, but when you invest, invest sensibly, invest in a diversified portfolio, and that will get you an appropriate return. Let me end by saying, um, many of you may have seen the Reserve Bank fighting against inflation, right? And again and again, we hear people saying, no, 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 don't fight against inflation, start cutting interest rates, uh, generate growth. But inflation is always, uh, inflation fighting is always trying to balance two things. The borrower who wants low interest rates and the saver who wants an adequate return. The problem in India for the last eight to 10 years has been the borrower has dominated the saver. Inflation has been 9% on average since 2006, between 2006 and 2013. So if you had a fixed deposit, which paid you eight or eight and a half percent, you were actually able to purchase less next year, even after interest, because 
the prices of goods were rising at 9%. You got 8% interest. That didn't compensate you for the fact that you had held back on consumption, and now you took your 108 rupees to the market. You, couldn't, you could buy less than last year when the goods that now cost 109 rupees were worth only 100 rupees. So investing has been a bad idea over this time, which is why so many people have grown, grown to buy gold. They've gone to, gone to buy real estate which results in less financial savings in the country, which means if we need savings, we borrow from outside. And if we borrow from outside, that makes us a debtor to the world, dangerous thing to do in this very volatile world. Which is why we've been focused on bringing down inflation. We've kept interest rates at a level which gives savers a reasonable return. For the first time in almost 10 years, the saver actually beats inflation. If you have a fixed deposit at 8.5%, 8 8% today, you're actually getting a positive return over and above inflation. You can take the money and buy more after a year or two of savings than you could buy at the beginning. Wasn't true in the past. And that's why it's important to fight this fight, to bring down inflation so that both the borrower and the saver can face low interest rates. Low interest rates which are adequate enough for the saver because they beat inflation by one or two percentage points so that they get a return for their savings. But also a rate which is not so high that the borrower will not invest. And that's what we're trying to do overall. So that's my two cents on financial education. I'm sure the workshop and the discussions will be far more detailed and far more enriching. But uh, if you remember one thing, right, that there's no return without risk, I think you've got 85% of the financial education that you need. But not to say the rest is not useful, it's dinning in this basic point, there is no return without risk. Let me stop there, thank you. So it's all right. Will you, uh, can I request you to take some questions? Sure. Uh, not on monetary policy. We see that uh, every day there's a chip fund fraud, chip fund fraud in India. And we see it's a loss. The losses are in the public have growth and many people suffer there. But the government, I don't see any policy by the government. Or what we, or what we can see is that the ground, ground support is too different from what the government is saying. So there is no policy by the government to stop or curb the movement of these differences. What is the RBI's decision or RBI's policy or? So um, there are a variety of fly-by-night operators uh, who promise the earth very high interest rates, and keep, get people to invest. Sometimes it's directly as a, as a kind of deposit. Sometimes it's uh, you buy land with us, uh, pay installments, and we'll give you land uh, at a very cheap price, effectively promising a high interest rate. Now, um, sometimes these operators fall between cracks. No regulator has responsibility for them. We regulate entities that take deposits, but these are not deposits. They say these are advanced payments for land. Uh, so they, fall they used to fall between the cracks. And as a result, they could grow you know, uh, to some size before anybody noticed that a lot of people had invested their money in here, and that money was being misused in different ways. So I mean, there are legitimate chit funds, and there are not so legitimate chit funds also. And so th that, those, are, those are problematic. What we've uh, done over the last year and a half is uh, we've brought all the regulators together in what is called a state-level coordination committee, where the chief secretary sits along with the, uh, you know, the um, enforcement directorate, financial frauds unit, et cetera. And we examine what schemes are there in different parts of the state, which are possible co uh, source for concern. And then a special unit starts monitoring that to see if, in fact, this is a fly-by-night operator. So that's one, one attempt to get at this. Uh, we in the RBI coordinate the state-level coordination committee, but the point is law enforcement can go after these guys with the regulators being coordinated so that they don't slip through the cracks. That's one. 
second thing is the existence of these reflects two things. One, the lack of financial literacy. People aren't paying enough attention when this fellow promises high returns because it could be that he's recruited your neighbor to be his, his sales agent. And you trust your neighbor. Your neighbor says, this is a sure thing. Look, I took my money out twice. But it's a bit like those, uh, you remember the stock picking that I told you, the 128 down to 64. It's one of those guys can sell you saying, this guy has been right four times in a row. But he's basically selling uh, fake goods. The other thing is we have to get formal finance everywhere. One of the reasons these chit funds are successful is some rural areas, for example, there's not enough access to formal finance in an easy way. You can't put a fixed deposit in the State Bank of India or in, uh, in HDFC in those places. And so we need to extend the formal financial system everywhere so that we can rule out these people. But that said, even if we extend formal finance, I think without financial education of the kind that you're receiving or you're giving, it'd be very hard to completely rule out this possibility. Oh, well, um, we certainly have a lot of financial literacy programs, but uh, we have to find a way to scale it up because it has to reach everywhere and scale it up in a user-friendly fashion. That is why programs like this one are so important because it is being driven by people who are natural teachers and who understand what people don't understand. I tell you the hardest thing in teaching, even when I teach my kids, my wife will attest, is putting yourself in the other person's shoes and understanding what they don't understand. Because you, you understand it. So that's, that's really what's difficult. When we teach financial literacy, if we teach as if we know, it's not clear the other person gets it. Because we're not teaching the things that seem complicated to them or explaining the things that seem complicated. So we need natural teachers who understand their audience to help us impart and to them, we can try and impart what needs to be imparted, right? So that is why this, this two level, we try and teach the teachers, teachers go on, is extremely important. And we're trying to, programs like this, I think we would like to encourage many more of. But I also believe two other things. One, that we are burdening students with a lot. If you talk to CBAC, they'd say, oh, you want financial education, somebody else wants health education, third party wants uh, um, you know, some other kind of education, all of which are very important, all of which we need in the individual, right? So we have to weigh these things against how much are we going to, I'm, I'm sure you kids have pretty heavy school bags, right? Lots of books in them. Uh, no, you don't, you leave them at school. Anyway, when we were kids, we had very heavy school bags. And there was a concern, you know, more and more we had to, after all, you know, there's all these colleges, college entrance exams we have to give, IIT, uh, medical, this, that. On top of all that, putting something more, we have to be careful about how much we put. So the quantum is, is quite important. Second thing is, I believe we should teach the students how important it is so they go seek it out. Because this two day, one week, two weeks will not be enough. They need lifelong education for which they have to be convinced it's important. Um, often when something is forced down people, they basically say, okay, I have to do this. And after that, I'm not gonna be interested. If we don't make it interesting enough. So by making it interesting enough, we give them the ability to choose. And, uh, and maybe they pick us, they pick this. And once they pick voluntarily, I think it's more something they will go out and seek outside the school, which actually is where the, eventually the bulk of learning will take place, right? So I, I think our focus, at least my personal view is that focus should be on making it interesting enough that they want to learn more. They go out and learn more, uh, but they're exposed in a small way to it. And to that extent, I would work with the uh, uh, education authorities to create a small space and then use that as the acorn which creates the big tree over time. But making a large portion compulsory, I think, would be uh, both difficult and I'm, I'm not too convinced that we should do that at this point. 
My question is, have you ever thought that one day you will be the governor of RBI? Plus, second question, as you said that we have to take risk while investing our own money. How much risk you take to invest your hard earned money? So, um, uh, very good questions. Very good questions. Uh, the answer is no. I did not think one day I would be here. I, I wanted to be in an economic decision-making uh, position, and I thought the Reserve Bank would be a place where you'd get the most freedom to make economic decisions, because otherwise you're part of a, you're a small peg in the larger government. So I thought this would be great if, if it could happen one day. But uh, you know, uh, for most kids, Reserve Bank is a, is a boring position. I think most of you dream of being uh, other things, right? Uh, fighter pilots, Nobel Prize winning doctors, etc. Not not Reserve Bank governors. So um, second uh, is uh, how do I invest? I have a fairly diversified portfolio. Uh, I do have a small portfolio of stocks where before I entered this job, I used to play around a little bit just to have fun. I don't think I ever made money excess returns in those stocks. Every once in a while, I'd see one stock go up tremendous amounts, and I'd say, I'm a genius. I'd ignore all the ones that went down and, uh, and I didn't make money on. So I, I'd say, have a little fun if you want, but largely keep your portfolio. Most of my portfolio is in diversified uh, mutual funds. Uh, I have some uh, fixed deposits, some bond holdings,